was two years ago today, the East Troublesome Fire, one of the worst in Colorado history, raced through Grand County. On this day in 2020, it burned into Grand Lake, killing two people and destroying more than 360 homes. From there, the fire jumped the Continental Divide and burned through Rocky Mountain National Park. It forced all of Estes Park to evacuate under dark orange skies, but fortunately a change in the winds and some fire prevention work slowed that fire down and spared the town from what firefighters say could have been a worst case scenario. That fire became Colorado's second largest on record, burning more than 193,000 acres, about 300 square miles. We still do not know how that fire started. As many Coloradans remember that day, we are faced with more red flag warnings right now, which understandably has some people worried. Yeah, it's very important to remember that fire. So let's check in with Kathy on what the fire danger looks like this weekend. Kathy. We have another day of elevated fire danger. You too with temperatures running 15 to 20 degrees above the average of about 64 where we should be about this time of year. There's a teeny bit of smoke and haze in the air today, but that smoke is from wildfires burning in Montana and Wyoming. So as we look live over Denver, calm, quiet, warm, but the wind will be increasing ahead of a Pacific cold front that's already approaching western Colorado. Also helping to bring in some of the high and mid layer clouds, a bit of a mountain wave event shaping up due to the northwest winds aloft. Those northwest downsloping winds dry out the atmosphere, dropping our humidity values into the single digits and providing us with current temperatures like these. Some 15 to 20 degrees above average, 83 in Lamar, 77 in Denver, almost 70 in the Colorado high country. And the winds are whipping out there, especially over some of the higher passes, Loveland Pass, Red Feather Lakes, and up around Cheyenne. The wind takes that moisture out of the atmosphere. With the warmth, we're seeing red flag mornings in the magenta area through six o'clock this evening. Fire weather watch areas in the areas kind of in the light gray or brown that'll carry over into Saturday. This red flag warning may be reinstated tomorrow because the high pressure ridge keeping the storm track to the north only starts to break down after tomorrow, but it will break down. You guys aren't going to believe this. The first winter storm watch of the season goes out over the weekend. Skiers rejoice. Here you go. Six to 12 inches of snow possible late Saturday into Sunday, and that means those of you that are camping, hiking, or are unaware need to pay attention to the weather. You're going to go up there in the 60s and be driving back in what could be some heavy snow. No snow in Denver tonight. Comfortable, beautiful Friday evening. Coming up, we'll have the forecast for the big Broncos game on Sunday. We'll talk much more in depth about the fire danger and how about that snow in the forecast. You guys, we might see a little bit of a rain snow mix here in Denver on Monday. Well, you can't say no to moisture. No. Can't say no to free water. So even if it's frozen, yeah. Well, no. That's what I thought. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. All right, we'll see you later. Happening today, the committee investigating the January 6th riot at the U.S. Capitol has officially sent a, a subpoena to former President Donald Trump. The group wants Trump to sit for a deposition, which will be under oath, and they want him to provide some documents. Both of those things they want by next month. The committee has painted Trump as a central figure in the efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. It is unclear if former President Trump will comply with the subpoena. A dedicated educator and a loving family man. That's how T.J. Cunningham was remembered today by a former colleague at Hinckley High School in Aurora. A former CU football star, Cunningham was shot and killed back in 2019 over a dispute about a parking spot. Yesterday, an Arapahoe County jury convicted the man accused of pulling the trigger. Here is 9 News crime and justice reporter Matt Jablow. It's still so raw. It's still so raw to like so many of us. Three years later, Julie Stevens can hardly hold back the tears, talking about the life and death of her good friend and former colleague, T.J. Cunningham. When the news hit Hinckley High School that he had been shot, we couldn't even breathe. It was like the heartbeat of the school just like stopped. And in February of 2019, Cunningham was murdered as a result of an ongoing dispute over a parking spot with a man who lived in his Aurora neighborhood. According to prosecutors, the two men agreed to settle the dispute in the parking lot of Eagle Crest High School, where Cunningham was then shot and killed. On Thursday, the suspect, Marcus Johnson, was found guilty of second degree murder. It's justice. It's justice for TJ Cunningham. The 46-year-old Cunningham was a married father of five children. He was a Colorado native and a star football player at CU who played one year in the NFL. When his playing days were over, 
He came back to Colorado and became an educator, first a special education teacher and later an assistant principal at Hinckley High School in Aurora, where he worked for the last three years of his life with Julie Stevens. He was just there for everyone. Stevens describes Cunningham as kind, funny, and compassionate. He just made you feel better about yourself, just spending a couple of minutes with him. A man, she says, with a magnetic personality who is driven to improve the lives of young people. He was a champion. He was always looking at the strength of kids and always looking at their potential. Stevens says Cunningham's death, and especially the violent way he died, shook the Hinckley High School community at the time and still leaves her shaken to this day. He left a void in the community that will never be filled. Marcus Johnson, the man convicted yesterday of killing Cunningham, will be sentenced on December 2nd. He faces up to 48 years in prison. Jenny, Jeremy. Yeah, what a loss to the community. Yeah, thank you, Matt. If not for a nonprofit, a couple of motels on East Colfax might still be closed. Now they're open again, and by next year, rooms will be free to people experiencing homelessness. It's being called a creative solution to a crisis. Nine News reporter Noel Brennan is here now to explain. Noel, this sounds like a really interesting way to help curb or at least help try to solve some of the problem when it comes to people experiencing oh, homelessness. Absolutely. And we're talking about two hotels, the Westerner and the Sand and Sage Motel. They're two of more than 30 motels along Colfax. The nonprofit, the Fax Partnership, now owns them both with big plans for the future. The nonprofit says those motels closed last year for nuisance issues, but rooms are back open and they're 20 percent cheaper. The plan is to keep the motels as motels for the year, but in 2023, the Fax will convert them to non-congregate shelters for people experiencing homelessness. Rooms will also house people displaced by redevelopment of another hotel on Colfax. The Fax has tried three other times to buy motels along Colfax. Several lenders stepped up to make it happen this time. You can buy them and provide immediate housing. That housing can help you pay for the debt it takes to acquire these properties. And then you have a business model so that while you're putting together your redevelopment plan, and those plans take a long time, you can keep affording the holding of the property. Eventually, the fax wants to tear down the two motels and build deed-restricted affordable housing, but right now, there is a billboard standing in their way. It's right next to the motels, and the permit doesn't expire until 2028. But the fact says maybe that billboard, it's a silver lining. It'll give them time to work with the city and other partners on plans for future affordable housing. They're envisioning a six to seven story building with ground floor use as well for uh, perhaps a rec center and a library. Yeah. So big plans. And, and you know, you hear from uh, people who advocate for people experiencing homelessness and they will tell you time and time and again that housing, lack of affordable housing is the number one cause of homelessness here in Denver. Absolutely. Yeah. And an option like this gets people in housing right away while they're working on this redevelopment plan for that space to be something else, which can house more people. Very interesting, Noel. Thank Noel, you for that report. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Coming up after the break, Denver Police Chief is in studio talking about Halloween safety and a couple of events that DPD has coming up over the next week for families.